America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you for the second half of the Power Hour, right here on TFRlive.com and the iHeartRadio app. And in the first half of the program, we were talking about uh, something that the media has not talked about very much for the last two weeks during this whole border kerfuffle, and that is the real and legitimate cost of illegal immigration, the, the lives that are taken the death, the destruction, the murders, the rapes, uh, the overall crime and danger that we're all in by illegal aliens. Of course, the, the, the media doesn't want to show you that. They just want to show you the doe-eyed crying children and try to guilt you into allowing this invasion, this infestation of our country to occur. We told you about that, and then we went through the intellectual exercise of creating a good immigration plan from the ground up. We didn't want to talk about any of the, the bills that are already out there and the compromises that are already out there. Instead, we thought, hey, if you could if you could create an immigration policy, an immigration bill from a blank sheet of paper, what would it be? And uh, I came up with five points that I thought were a great starting uh, point or a great starting rubric for an immigration policy. Number one is build the wall and have backup for that wall with military on the border. Number two, end the uh, misdemeanors for first-time offenders who cross the border. Make them all felonies. Anyone who comes across the border, anyone caught over here without their documentation, felony, automatic, straight out. Number three, enforce those felonies with stricter penalties up to and including the death penalty. Number four, while we get all of this sorted out and go through the process of getting all the illegals out of here that are already within our borders, let's have a no asylum policy for a few years. Not saying permanent, but just no asylum for maybe five or ten years while we get everything squared away on our end. And then after that point, of course, we can go back to a limited asylum and, and, and asylum that makes sense. Maybe restructure that from the ground up. And then number five, to answer the question of, well, Americans won't do those jobs. you got to have immigrants. We take up the idea of ending the minimum wage and drastically reducing welfare. Therefore, those uh, freeloaders in America that are already on welfare now and not working, uh, maybe they could do those jobs for you know 2 or $3 a day that the illegal immigrants are doing. I, and, and don't get me wrong, I do not have a problem at all with people picking lettuce for Two dollars or three dollars a day. I don't. I don't think that anybody uh, should be guaranteed a specific wage or a specific standard of living just by method of of them breathing air and taking up space. But I sure do like the idea better of poor Americans doing those jobs rather than poor Mexicans and poor El Salvadorians and poor Central Americans, while poor Americans get to live high on the hog and, and not work. That's wrong. Uh, so let's get that back into into order that way. So that was my five point plan for immigration. Again, you can discuss those with me and add or subtract things as you like uh, by getting at me on Twitter at real Travis Cook. Also, uh, since we are talking about immigration this week, I did want to take a moment out of my time. Uh, something we haven't really done much, but it's. I don't know if I want to be cheesy enough to call this a public service announcement, but I, I, I guess it kind of is that. We're sitting here talking about the danger of illegal immigrants. We're talking about different laws you could pass and so forth, and all of it, all of that has its place. But I know some of you are out there right now saying, that's all well and good, but, but what can I do now? What can I do to help out today? What can I do where I am at this point in my life right now to help this problem. Well, I have something you can you can do, you can consider. I'd like to mention to all of you that if you are aware of the presence of illegal aliens in, in a specific location or, or even have a reasonable suspicion of, of let's say, a workplace that, that is hiring them or or neighbors or people on your street that have given you reason to believe they may be illegal aliens, uh, that you do have a method of recourse. You can call Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, ICE, as they're also known. You can call them at 
1-866-DHS, the number two and the word ICE. That's 1-866-DHS-2-I-C-E. Uh, translated to the full telephone number, that is 1-866-347-2423. So if you are aware of or have genuine suspicion of the presence of illegal aliens in your own neighborhood, your own town, a workplace somewhere, uh, an apartment complex, if you see, because I, I've seen it up here, you know, before where there's, there'll be like an apartment complex and some illegals where they're, it's a two bedroom apartment. And they've got like 12 people in there or something. If you're seeing things like that, um, call one 347 2423 for immigrations and customs enforcement. And they can look into it. one dhs 2 ice and, um, They can investigate it and take care of the situation. Um, As we always say in every aspect of life, if you see something, say something. And that is something you can do today. That is something you can keep your eye out on and be aware of and be situationally aware, as as we always say. That's something every one of us can do. Now, as we discuss all that we've seen and heard over the last couple of weeks, I do want to take some time to talk about the press's treatment of this little kerfuffle on the border. Uh, and, and I alluded to it earlier uh, about them using the Sally Struthers tactics on how they report this. But I got to thinking, got to thinking yesterday. We are, we are constantly hearing people complain about Americans not trusting the mainstream media the way they used to. Article after article has been written about America's last lack of trust in mainstream journalism and how horrible that supposedly is for our republic. And how, by golly, we just can't have a functioning democracy. We don't have a democracy. We have a republic. But whenever you hear these people talk about it, they always frame it in the terms of a democracy. How if we if, if we don't have trust in, in the journalists, if, if we don't, if we don't let them have their place of influence on us, then by golly, it's just going to harm our democracy, harm our republic. It's going to harm America. There has been much navel-gazing over the last couple of years at how people are turning away from the mainstream media, myself included. But I was thinking to myself yesterday, If you ever needed an example, or if you ever needed an explanation for why fewer and fewer Americans trust the media the way that we used to, why we're critical of it, why we ask questions of it now when our grandparents would just come home from work and turn on Walter Cronkite or Chet Huntley and believe whatever they said, And we're actually skeptical of it now. If you ever wanted to know why, well, frankly, their actions and their reporting over the last couple of weeks would be about the best example I can give you. Would be about the best explanation that, that I can give you. What have we seen for the last couple of weeks out of America's journalists? I mean, we've seen him at the border. We've seen him in the detention centers. Every network has sent somebody down there to breathlessly report on this thing. We've seen some of them reduced to tears. And what have we seen? We've not really seen reporting. We've seen advocacy much more than we've seen reporting. An advocacy for what? We have seen our media over the last couple of weeks advocate for foreign people who are invading our country. Now you can dress that up in cute little kids all you want to. You can try and jerk at the heartstrings all you want to. You can try and shed crocodile tears all you want to, but when you boil 
all of that away, when you boil all of the accoutrements away, when you boil all the labels away, what are you left with? You are left with a media that has spent the last two weeks taking the side of non-Americans, foreigners, who are trying to come into this nation illegally. That's what you've seen. And none of us are surprised by it. Back when we saw President Trump negotiating with uh, Kim Jong-un or going through the summit or engaging with him, they flipped out about that. Siding with those who don't want us to be successful in denuclearizing North Korea. When we go further back to the various urban riots we've had over the last few years, of course, Ferguson being just down the road from where we're recording now, and we saw the violence and the buildings being burned and the people being robbed and shot at and everything else, and we saw another round of it this summer out here at the Darren Stockley case, and other cities have seen it as well, Baltimore, New York, Minneapolis, which may be going through another round of it, as I understand it. And what do we see every time? We see the reporters right there, not taking the side of the police, not taking the side of the law-abiding citizen, but instead taking the side of the people who are harming the police and harming the law-abiding citizen. That's what we're seeing out of the media. Now, a lot of people have used a lot of big words and tried to do some research in trying to determine j just, just what is it that's making these Americans have less trust in the media than they used to have. Why, we can't just figure it out. Folks, it's very simple. The reason we don't trust you is very, very simple. It is because you have consistently and to this point predictably backed the very people and advocated for the very people who are harmful to us. Harmful to American citizens. Harmful to that hard-working American every day who's going out there to make a life for their family, trying to go out and work and maybe have some time with their kids and keep a roof over their head and food on their table. And as we do that, we have to, we have to strategize for how to deal with the dangers around us, be they urban thugs, illegal aliens, Muslim terrorists, whatever it may be. We never know where the next danger is around the corner. And yet, as we take those precautions, you call us bigots. You call us racists. You call us xenophobes or Islamophobes or homophobes or whatever it might be. But for all of your name-calling, it doesn't resolve the fact that we have these dangers to deal with every day even still. And it gets to a point where protecting our family and even enhancing our family, not only protecting them, but helping them do well, helping them progress, helping them have a better life, it gets to a point where doing those things is a whole hell of a lot more important to us than whether or not we get your approval. You're trying to kick Trump supporters out of restaurants and Maxine Waters telling people to go harass Trump officials, but and you're you're all on their side with that, but you don't realize that you are completely disconnected from the American people. I mean, let's boil it down. I mean, let, let, let's boil it down. Let's we're talking about journalism. Let, let's set aside the labels of conservative and liberal for a moment. Let's set aside the labels of Republican and Democrat for a moment. What are we seeing? We are seeing 
a political and, and a journalistic mainstream, a journalistic establishment that is siding with America's enemies more often than not. Now, if you're an American citizen who wants his nation protected and wants to be able to protect his family, wants to enhance their lives, then how could you trust a journalistic establishment or a media that does that? How could you do that? How could you trust a journalist that cares more about your demise and the advancement of somebody else than they do you? It would be ludicrous to trust that journalist. It would be ludicrous to allow him to influence you. Let's think for a moment about what the purpose of journalism is. I remember, and this goes back a long way, you, a lot of you may not remember this, or you may never have run across it. Back in, I think, the late 1980s, mid-80s, late 80s, on PBS, there was some kind of a, I don't know if you want to call it a symposium or a roundtable or something like that, where they had all these like really big-time journalists in there. And they were discussing journalism as a concept and journalism as a profession. Mike Wallace was there. Peter Jennings was there. They had some big-time people on this panel. And they were asking all these different questions of, well, how would a journalist handle this and how would a journalist handle that? It was kind of a, kind of a thing celebrating journalism, if you will. And I'm, this is coming from the recesses of my memory here, but I remember... I believe it was Mike Wallace who was asked a question about, you know, if you're a journalist and, and you're writing a story and, and you see someone about to, with, with a knife out about to kill somebody, do you intervene and prevent it from happening or do you stand there and, and keep the camera rolling and report it? And his answer was, you stand there and report it. You don't intervene with the man about to lose his life. And I remember, and I must have been 12 or 13 years old when I saw this. Again, this was a long time ago. But I remember seeing that and saying, and, and thinking to myself, my God, how messed up is that? If journalists are just going to stand there and report while harm comes to me, then what good are the journalists? What, what benefit do I get from them? If I'm dead, what benefit do I get, right? Well, you fast forward to today. Every journalism school in the nation, and I went to the University of Missouri where we had one of the supposedly best journalism schools anywhere. So even though I was not in the J school myself, I, I was surrounded by this groupthink. I was surrounded by budding little journalists the whole time I was in, in college. Some of which, by the way, have gone on to become very famous people. People I knew in college have gone on to have burgeoning careers. People you would have heard of. And I was surrounded by this mindset of, well, journalism is there to be the referee. And they're not there to help America. They're not there to help the American people. They never come out and say it. But instead, they are there to push humanity forward. It, it, it's a whole bunch of garbage you heard out of them. But it's always been my it's always been my belief that American journalists need to remember that they're Americans first and journalists second. Not that they shouldn't find facts and and do journalism, but that when it when this a situation arises where your journalism starts harming the United States, then your journalism needs to take a back seat. Because after all, what good does it do us if your journalism harms our nation? Doesn't do us any good at all. And would we have tolerated way back in the day, would we have tolerated a press in World War II that sided with the Japanese? No, we'd have run them out of town. But here we are today with a press that advocates for illegal immigrants or an, a press that whenever there's a Muslim terrorist attack, they 
constantly chide people for jumping to conclusions or being Islamophobic, as it were. A journalism establishment that whenever we have a city go up in flames because of urban thuggery always uh, cautions us against racism and criticizing any of these people, even though they're shooting cops and burning down our businesses. And on a daily basis, murdering people and carjacking us and robbing us, etc. But none of that matters to them. It has gotten to the point with modern journalism where you have to ask the question, whose side are you on anyway? And again, I'm not saying that in terms of a political side. I'm not saying that in terms of, of a political party or an ideological side. I'm saying that in terms of, are you on America's side or not? Or more poignantly, are you on my side or not? Is your journalism based in helping me maintain and enhance the future and protection of me and my loved ones? By what I've seen out of it lately, the answer to that is no. The journalists seem to care a lot more about some other folks, a lot of other folks, than they do me. So what's the point? Why should I be influenced by them? Why should I trust them? If they're working against my best interest, that's the last person I would trust, isn't it? <laughs> 